welcome to TMC 2021 online. This session, like many others, has been pre-recorded and is available on demand. Get the facts on couplings. This is a very important subject that is often not understood. Many have opinions. However, for this session, we have assembled three suppliers who are each a member of the ITC to provide delegates with some advice on the key issues and issues relating to couplings. For this session, we have three speakers. Sam Ellis from Jost Australia. Sam has been involved in transport and automotive engineering for over 20 years with roles covering research, fuel cell systems, vehicle dynamics and vehicle development. In 2018, he joined Jost as head engineer and works closely with Jost global engineering team to develop products that meet the needs of Australian trucking manufacturers and transport operators. Sam is an active ITC member, participates in various technical committees and led the working group that developed the drawbar tap, the drawbar trailer tap. Our second speaker will be Nemanja Militech from SAF Holland, better known as Reggie. Nemanja earned his bachelor and master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Belgrade, Serbia in 1992. After moving with his family to Australia in 2002, Nemanja's first local job was with Henriks and Asia Pacific as design engineer. In 2007, he started with Iveco as a special applications engineer and then joined SAF Holland in 2008 in the role of chief engineer. Nemanja was nominated as an industry icon by Smedley's engineers in 2019. Finally, Ian Thompson from BPW Transpect. Ian has been engineering manager at BPW Transpect for more than 10 years and has extensive knowledge about BPW supply, axles, brake systems and trailer couplings. Ian has worked in the heavy trailer industry for more than 25 years and previously worked for semi-trailer tanker and trailer manufacturers. Ian is actively involved in industry groups for braking systems and couplings, including current ADR reviews. Ian is a member of the ATA Industry Technical Council and is chair of the council's safety working group. These ITC members provided key input into the development of the drawbar trailers tap. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to Sam. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so I, um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, coupling maintenance uh, and then later on talking about training. So the, I guess, uh, the number one thing that I would like people to take away from this, uh, from this uh, presentation, if nothing else, is that when it comes to maintenance and installation for that matter, uh, when it comes to maintenance, please follow the manufacturer's guidelines. It's, uh, it's the number one thing which, uh, which really will uh, enable you to uh, make sure that your equipment is properly maintained and will last as long as possible. So make, uh, follow the manufacturer's guidelines first. If for some reason it's not possible to get those guidelines, uh, the manufacturer, uh, the, the, the part that you're, uh, that you're uh, maintaining, the manufacturer may, know, uh, may not be in existence anymore, or it might, might be an obsolete part, or it could just be something that's been imported and then the, uh, the instructions are not locally available. If for some reason it's not possible to get the manufacturer's guidelines, then following information that is recognised as being best practice or industry standard and compliant with the regulations is the next best step. And you can get that information uh, readily from either the, the regulator through the, uh, the National Heavy Vehicle uh, Inspection Manual, or you can follow the guidelines in BSB 6 which uh, if you do, then you, you at least be bringing the material, the, the component up to the standard that it should be when it was, uh, was uh, installed to meet the standards and the guidelines. I'll now go through a few uh, of the typical checks that you would do on coupling equipment and, uh, and just sort of touch on a few things, perhaps from a supplier's perspective of some of those, those things, those questions that often come my way when, uh, when uh, workshops or, um, or fleet managers uh, looking to maintain their equipment properly. It's the one thing that I often get asked for is, is what are the wear limits? So the first thing I then do is then direct the, uh, the, the workshop to the installation manual or the, or the product guide. And, uh, and those, those product guides contain the wear limits for the critical components. 
we're usually talking about toe eye diameters or the pin diameter on, on a coupling. Uh, often the bush thickness inside the toe eye or the bushes in, inside a coupling. But one thing that's often overlooked is, is free play or lash. And that is, uh, so if we, if we look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cross section here of a, uh, of a pin type coupling, most manufacturers would say there should be no fore aft movement at all in that coupling and there should be minimal up and up down movement in that and so one thing to check when you're uh, in, the, in the workshop is make sure that the uh, that, that those components which are often hidden away from view behind the the cross member of the of the tow bar um, they're hidden away from view but then if you if you if you um, push and pull on them and find that there's any lash in there at all then it's probably an indication that something needs to be replaced I guess one other thing that I'd like to point out too is that most, most manufacturers would probably have some sort of gauge that can often facilitate a quick check. That gauge can even be put into the truck and can be used for, for field checks if required. But uh, for example, down here in the bottom corner, we've got a, a go no go gauge, which basically means that if the gauge doesn't fit over the eye, that is, it doesn't go over, then it's okay. It hasn't worn down enough. But if it does, if the gauge does go over the pin in this case, then in this particular case, it's, it's past the limit of um, the, the, the wear tolerance of 46 millimeters being the, the minimum that the pin is allowed to, uh, to accept in this case. So a go-no gauge is, 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 a, uh, is a handy tool to have in your kit for a quick check to make sure that something is, uh, is still compliant or not. The next thing which I'm often asked for is, is the torque. Again, these, uh, these specifications are included in the owner's manual or the installation guides. That, uh, that are available from the manufacturer. One thing that I would like to point out, and this is a, a, a key thing, is that if you have a torque specification, particularly say as shown here uh, in the diagram, this is, the, uh, this is the, the, the large hexagonal retaining nut on the back of a, of a pin type coupling. And often the torque that's required to, to, uh, to maintain that is quite high. It could be 500 Newton meters or more. Um, and when applying that torque, in order to retain the torque using a split pin or some other method, uh, it's required to torque up and then insert uh, a, a split pin, for example, here. Now, the one thing that you must not do is to relax the torque in order to get the, the slots to line up with a hole. You should always tighten and then tighten again in order to be able to get a clear, uh, clear sight into that hole and put in the pin. Never back off the torque, otherwise you've just relaxed the torque and it's no longer meeting the specified 500 Newtons or more. So checking the tension and making sure that that nut at the back of the coupling, which is a critical component, is always ten tensioned is, um, is very important. Same for a demountable toe eye, same procedure and same uh, warnings, I suppose, apply, making sure that the tension on that nut is, is always done up to the right uh, specified amount and that the split pin or the retaining uh, pin is always in place. I often get asked about questions about uh, Loctite on these things. Now, unless the, customer, the, the manufacturer specifies it, it's usually not necessary to put Loctite on, the, uh, on those nuts. But in some cases, for example, if we, if we weren't using bolts to, uh, to mount a pindle hook, we were using screws going into a mounting plate, uh, then sometimes a manufacturer would specify Loctite. So it's important to check the, uh, the manufacturer's guides. Of course, when something comes in for inspection, it's important to check for damage. Uh, sometimes damage is obvious, like the, the examples here in the picture, where we've got a, a bent drawbar here on the right, or we've got some cracks now. Obviously, this is more than just a crack, um, but uh, it's fair to say that, that uh, this, this damage, this, this separation didn't just happen suddenly. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been the onset of a crack that probably wasn't picked up earlier. And, uh, and then that's resulted in, uh, in a, separate, a trailer separation. So looking for cracks and tears, both in welds and in steel sections. And also if you see any sort of bend in a drawbar, it's best to check to make sure that the, the strength of that drawbar is still uh, acceptable. And uh, often you'll find there's, it's very difficult to get guidelines on what are the acceptable limits in bends for drawbars. Um, the, uh, I would recommend that um, that we send people to um, uh, to the ATA uh, drawbar tap, where there is some information on uh, on drawbar bends there. 
but uh, there's there's uh, there's very little information around uh, from, from official sources or from regulations as to what an acceptable bend in a drawbar. And so the baseline statement would be if it's bent, it's not acceptable. So um, best, best to keep that in mind. One thing I would uh, encourage everyone to do though, if you're looking at, uh, at um, equipment on drawbars, that is to make sure that, that you are inspecting those things which you don't normally see. So often we'll have covers put on top of, um, on uh, the, the, the front of the drawbar eye. That's put there for a good reason. It's there to protect it from abrasion when, when tipping. But unfortunately it also means that often the drawbar eye is out of sight and out of mind. So don't, don't forget to take off the covers and, uh, and have an inspection of those things which, uh, which you don't see, especially also even on the daily checks. So if you've got a daily startup routine that requires uh, a drawbar eye to be inspected, then peeking under the cover is, uh, is uh, necessary in order to be able to complete that check. The, uh, the center picture here shows a, a, a welded toe eye on the front of a drawbar and um, it's, uh, it's been uh, reinforced with some additional plates on the side. Now that's kind of important, I suppose, because uh, the, I, I'm pretty, sure, pretty certain that the manufacturer of this drawbar eye probably specifies that for proper installation, the eye must be mounted with one, two, three, four welds in place. Now, the, the way that this uh, trailer manufacturer has, uh, has achieved that is by adding some uh, supporting plates on the side to uh, attach the top weld there. Unfortunately, in this case, these plates make it very difficult to inspect the integrity of the welds underneath the, um, uh, underneath the plate. So I guess if I was to make an appeal to, to, to trailer builders, that would be to, uh, to also to look at the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, that is the, the, um, the supplier of the toe-eye, but look at their instructions and install the toe-eye accordingly, because that will enable both the welds to be inspected and also the full rating of that toe-eye to, uh, to be met. Similarly, when it comes to uh, doing up the, 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 the nut on this demountable toe-eye, uh, depending on the design of the trailer, it can be very difficult to gain access to this nut. And if it's very difficult to gain access to a nut, sometimes some workshops may decide just not to check it. It's too difficult. So as a, as a trailer designer, uh, I, I would uh, strongly recommend that, that uh, consideration is given to how the workshop will be able to access these parts in order to maintain their proper condition and servicing. If you are presented with a, with a, a drawbar eye that is very difficult to, to do up, then that's a challenge that's going to have to be overcome because the tension on that nut must meet manufacturer specifications if it's going to be legally um, uh, operated on the road. One thing that you can always do to, uh, to, to make sure that you're on top of what, um, what the current guidelines are and what the rules are is to inform yourself and the NHVR has issued VSG4, which is, uh, talks about the inspection of drawbar eyes. And so a lot of the things which I've just talked about around torques and uh, weld integrity and, um, and, and the like is, um, is included in this, uh, in this document. And as Bob mentioned earlier, the ATA has issued a tap on drawbar trailers. And there's a lot of good information there which uh, summarizes some of the things that we've discussed in today's session. Lastly, I'd also like to remind people that um, clean equipment is, uh, is safe equipment. So if you've got a, a coupling which is covered in debris, it might be old grease, it might be um, sticks and stones, it could be gravel, uh, anything that is, uh, that is caught up inside the moving parts of a coupling is a potential um, uh, opportunity for the coupling to jam or to, uh, rem to um, give the appearance of being locked when it's actually not properly locked. And so uh, making sure that your equipment is clean and well lubricated is, uh, is essential to make sure, making sure that the coupling is both safe and will last longer. And one thing that I would like to add that uh, we'll often see uh, traveling out on the road, we'll often see pin type couplings like the one shown on, uh, on, in the picture here uh, being uh, driven around on the road in the open state. Now you can understand why, because uh, when, a, when a trailer is, uh, when a driver drops off a trailer and they open the coupling and then they drive away, um, they may be heading off to pick up another trailer and as they do so they just prefer to leave the coupling open. 
I think you'll find that most manufacturers would encourage or require couplings to be closed when they're, uh, when they're being driven on the road. And the good reason for that is that it prevents um, debris or dust or grit getting into the bottom bush, which can then prevent the coupling from closing properly. It also prevents debris and dust and grit getting up inside the, um, the coupling, which it can do when it's in the open state. And so if you want to make sure that your coupling uh, closes properly when it's supposed to, and that it doesn't get contaminated inside the mechanism, then closing the coupling after you've, uh, after you've decoupled the, the trailer is, uh, is, is uh, good advice. And uh, I'd like to sort of finish off this little section with uh, where I started, and that is uh, make sure you check with the manufacturer that you've got the, uh, the, the latest, the current uh, installation and um, uh, maintenance instructions. Um, every manufacturer has on their website some form of documentation. And if you can't find what you're asking for, then please just ring them up and ask. Every, every um, supplier in Australia uh, for, for coupling products has, uh, has a service department, has uh, engineering support, has maintenance guidelines, and, uh, and you can access that information by calling and, uh, and talking with a representative from the manufacturer. So when in doubt, ask. And even if, you're, if you don't doubt, if you, even if you're sure you know what it, uh, what it is that you're doing, it never hurts to check because you might find that you've uh, that there's been some updates in the the uh, the operating procedures or in the maintenance guidelines based on service actions that the supplier has has um, has experienced from uh, from issues in the field. So it's always a good idea to keep in touch with the manufacturer of the equipment that you use. And then lastly, I just like to touch on training. Uh, training is always good, and you can you can. Uh, Avail yourself of the good information that's available on manufacturers' websites or through conversations with uh, equipment manufacturers. And you'll find that some uh, equipment suppliers will actually even provide on-site training for you if, um, if there's, a, if there's a, a big enough need. So maintaining a good relationship with your equipment suppliers will help make sure that you receive the best information uh, and the most up-to-date information. But you can get guidelines on, on how to select the right equipment, how to install that equipment, uh, what the right inspection schedules or maintenance schedules are. And, uh, and even if you're, if, if you're off uh, the, the design stage of a piece of equipment, they can assist in, um, in sharing some of the, the wealth of knowledge that they have from all of the different applications that they see out in the field. Um, they can help you understand the best way to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make sure that you've got uh, the, the right uh, ratings on the equipment that you've got. So I would encourage you to uh, use that information that's available from the manufacturers. And I would also like to draw your attention again to the drawbar tap. Um, it has uh, really good information, some best practice guidelines on those dot points that are listed on the, the right hand side of the screen there. So everything from uh, how to choose the right equipment through to uh, how to operate it's, uh, how to operate that equipment safely. So that's it for me. Thanks very much for your attention. I'd like to hand back to Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Great presentation. Uh, you touched on one of my favorite things there about safety. Uh, you're right. Automatic pin coupling should not be, uh, you know, we always call them loaded, ready for coupling. Uh, sometimes you don't need to make have much movement in that pin. It'll come down. It'll be like a guillotine if there's a finger or anything in there. So uh, yeah, thanks very much, Sam. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Nemanja or Reggie. So I'd like to hand over to you, Nemanja. Okay. So okay. marking of the couplings is legislation. So 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 the ADR 62 and ADR 63 clearly specified that uh, every uh, component of coupling couple has to be marked. And uh, what is not specified in ADR uh, directly, ADR refers to the standard that will give more explanations. Basically, there are three main things that has to be presented on identification flight. That's the factory trade mark or name of the manufacturer. 
it has to have identification and it has to have rating. So for the couplings that they have only D value rating, they will have only D value. Or the, for the couplings that are vertically rated, rated for vertical load, they will have V value. And if applicable, the S value, which is uh, manufacturers approved uh, static vertical load. There are some differences between uh, requirements in the size of the letters for different type of couplings, but pretty much they should be or bigger than 2.5 mil letters, or they should be bigger than 6 mil for fifth wheels. Uh, identification plate should be clearly visible, even when the both components are coupled and uh, preferably must be attached to the component. Sometimes that's not practical and then in that case it could be attached in near proximity of the couple coupling but on the chassis of the vehicle. Uh, there are some issues sometimes with the vehicles that operate in harsh conditions uh, the letter stamping or molding is getting sandblasted or, 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 or damaged. So what we suggest is to contact your supplier and get a new plate or label because it must be there. It was interesting that you make reference to uh, D ratings and also to V rating. Uh, perhaps you can... Uh, uh, provide people with a little bit of an overview of uh, how the V rating impacts on the principles of a hinged versus a rigid draw bar. Okay. Well, first, the difference between hinged and rigid draw bar is uh, uh, articulation in vertical planes. So hinged draw bar has a, a pivot point that allows that draw bar to move freely in a vertical plane and because of that, it does not support or transfer the vertical slope to the coupling. Uh, opposite of that, the rigid draw bar is fixed. It doesn't have that pivot point and it can't move freely. So it supports the vertical load and, and transfer the vertical load to the coupling. Uh, this is particularly important with converter dollies because uh, uh, when we have braking situation, the load shifts to the front axles and actually overload, putting additional load on those front axles. And the hinge draw bar will absorb all of that load on, the, on their axles, while the, the, the rigid draw bar will transfer that load to the coupling. So, let's say the axles will suffer less, probably the tires will last a little bit longer and uh, maybe the, the, the whole combination will handle a little bit better the, 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 the braking situations. Um, I'd like for you to highlight for our audience some of the considerations regarding converter dollies uh, pig or center axle trailers, dog trailers, and tag trailers. Over to you, Nemanja. Yes, we, we, we all know that we have different kinds of trailers. And I will start with explaining uh, what is a dog trailer and pig trailer. So dog trailer is trailer that uh, consists of two axle groups where the front axle group is steerable. Uh, pig trailer is the trailer that has the axles centrally located. It has rigid draw bar, but there are some big trailers, I believe, as well with hinge draw bars, not too many. But what is important that that actually load is sent, the loading area is centrally air, uh, located over the axles, so the center of gravity is pretty much between the axles. Uh, once when we turn big trailer to converter dolly, then we can actually turn the semi trailer to be a dog trailer. So that's 
that's the explanation, let's say, on converter dolly, and hence the name converter is coming from. And uh, the last but not the least, we should mention tag trailers. Uh, they are kind of a peak trailers, but as I said, with peak trailers, the center of gravity is located over the axles, where with the peak uh, tag trailers, the axles are moved backwards, so the cent center of gravity is in front of the axle group. Uh, in accordance to what type of trailer we have, we should use the applicable coupling. So, so, so if we have a hinged drawbar, we will probably use the coupling that has D value only because we need to have that D value, but we don't need the vertical or the V value. Once when we have rigid drawbar, then we have to have coupling with the V value. Uh, every coupling, let's say, has its drawbar I, matching drawbar I. So, so, so there are some recommendations as well, which drawbar I to use in which application. So, so I would say that uh, pretty much the well-done and bolt-on drawbar I's should be used only with the hinged trailers, where the flanged and clamped drawbar I's can be used in both options with hinge and with rigid drawbar. Thanks, Nemanja. Now, um, the next phase of that is, is that with um, many trailers with rigid drawbars except uh, converter dollies, uh, there's the issue of uh, safety chains and many of they're mandated, but uh, what's your advice on safety chains? Well, safety chains, uh, must be part of a rigid robot trailer, uh, except if it's not a converter dolly. Why? Uh, the main purpose of safety chains is to, to hold the drawbar uh, in the air in case of separation with, with, with towing vehicle and to potentially steer that rigid drawbar trailer. Why? Because uh, with the hinge drawbar ride, there is a pivot point. So if separation happen, uh, trailer can still uh, drive in direction and is not going to get stuck with the drawbar and have the rollover. With the rigid drawbar, the drawbar will drop on the ground and actually make another contact point and the rollover will happen definitely immediately. So that's why safety chains have to hold that drawbar uh, of the ground. Uh, they have to be installed crossed and they have to be attached to the, how to say, substantial amount of chassis or, or, or frame of the vehicle. Uh, they could be attached by bolts or by welding. And uh, there are some recommendations about uh, size and, and, and strength of safety chains. So they have to withstand the minimum, the, 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 the ATM uh, of, the, of the trailer. And the mounting points, they have to withstand the force, okay, 985, 981. Uh, multiplied by the ATM of the trailer or the vertical force that will be 50% of that uh, longitudinal force. Uh, usually they are made of uh, steel that, is, that has uh, mechanical properties higher than 800 MPAs. And, and there is a standard for, for, for chains that actually specify how they should be made. Thanks, Demania. Okay. Hi. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Demania, for your presentation. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to welcome Ian. Over to you. And thanks, Ian. All right. Thanks. So I'd like to just run through a few other aspects to do with uh, the, the couplings, of course. Um, 
I'll try not to go into too much general detail of detail, but give you a general overview of some of the areas that perhaps need to be looked at and, and given some attention, of course. So one of the questions that people are often asked with couplings is this thing about D values, V values and S values that can create confusion for people of uh, what they need for their particular coupling. So through the Australian standards, there's some definitions laid down for what these uh, different values are. They come under Australian standard 2213. And each coupling will have some, normally uh, an ID plate on it or should have an ID plate on it, which will uh, specify what those values are and their values that the coupling manufacturer is actually tested that particular coupling to. So with those definitions from the Australian standard, I've just uh, listed out a very brief summary. The more detail, of course, is in the, in the standard itself. D value basically is the dynamic horizontal load or the straight pull rating for a, a given coupling. Then there's a D subscript C uh, value often given uh, if that coupling is applicable, which is normally used when you're doing a, a center axle or a, a pig type uh, trailer. The, the coupling manufacturer would also normally nominate for you uh, an S value, which is uh, simply a, a static vertical load that that particular coupling can take. So that's just when you're uh, essentially in the parked position, ready to take off, what the loading down through the uh, coupling would be onto the preceding um, vehicle there. Then there's also a V value, which is a, a vertical dynamic load capacity. And again, that's typically used when you're doing uh, a center axle trailer or potentially a, a rigid drawbar dolly or something of that nature. So as I say, the, the coupling manufacturers will have those um, figures uh, specified for their given coupling. And then it's up to the trailer manufacturer to determine for their given trailer type or the given type of combination, um, if that coupling is going to be suitable. So you, you typically then would normally need to go through a calculation to see that for your given trailer, does the, um, the value that you come out with for your calculation of your combination come below what that um, manufacturer's specified maximum rating would be. It's not only dependent on the type of combination in terms of number of vehicles and weights of vehicles that you're going to be towing in a given combination, it also has to do with um, the actual types of vehicles, as I say, whether it be a dolly or a dog trailer or a um, center axle or pig trailer setup. Uh, emphasis there would be, and I've just put a a bit of a slide here from the back of one of our um, brochures that the, the calculations that you need to use are laid down in the Australian standard. And often all the coupling manufacturers will put a summary or have a typical summary that they uh, use as well themselves, which is normally a reflection of what that standard is. And it gives you a quick guide of, of some of those uh, details that you can follow. Uh, again, it's, Quite right, it's important always with these things that if you have any questions to talk to your uh, coupling supplier or your um, engineering signatory, if you're a trailer manufacturer or, or a uh, repairer, to get some guidance on the values that you're using for your particular coupling um, are correct. We won't go through any of the mathematics on this, of course. This uh, uh, summary is just to show you a, a typical calculation and it gives you explanations in there of um, how that can be. Um, assessed. And, and these are all in the uh, public domain, these types of figures. So it's, we encourage you to, um, to seek them out and to, to use those. I'll maybe just emphasise there that sometimes when you do along with combinations, it doesn't always work out that the coupling that needs the highest uh, rating is necessarily towards the front of the combination. It can be towards the rear of the combination. So again, that's where it's important to go through the entire uh, vehicle combination to make sure that you've got the uh, suitable or applicable coupling in, in place. So if we just follow on a little bit from that, as I've mentioned that it, um, it's, it's often application 
um, based of, of what we need to uh, check in terms of coupling types. And I've just put a sample here for um, three different uh, typical types of, of uh, the toe couplings. So on the left side there, I've, I've put a, a Bartlett ball type coupling. Um, and we'd say with that one that, that that type of coupling, typically you can have a fairly high download and a sort of medium range of articulation. So um, I think normally they nominate up to about 22 degrees of, of oscillation or articulation in the between the two vehicles, which is, is quite good. And it's a very um, positive type coupling, not dissimilar to, to a, uh, a general tow ball that you might find on a passenger vehicle, but it has a few more, it's much heavier duty and has a few extra features, of course. In the middle of the, the screen there, I've put uh, one of our bread and butter type couplings uh, for, for our company, which is a uh, ring fed a um, 50 mil um, tow coupling. And this is something typically that has a quite a high pull or D value and a relatively low download value. So this coupling of course is, is often used in uh, three and four axle dogs right through to uh, long combination road train uh, type uh, vehicle applications. Then on the, the right side, I've put a pintle type coupling. Again, this is something that would have a fairly high um, articulation and, excuse me, uh, uh, relatively high uh, vertical load or download as required. Um, there is a little bit of a downside for that coupling, but the main thing that it does offer is quite a good uh, level of articulation. Just to show on the next uh, slide, it's just to show on the left side, a bit more of a photographic image of the Bartlett ball type coupling. Just uh, repeated our uh, ring feeder type in the center. And on the right side, you can see the pintle hook um, with the eye. Probably just at that point as well, I'll just say that one of the difficulties with the pintle type uh, coupling is that they're, um, a little bit more prone to um, having some movement between the eye and the, the hook, um, which is a little bit of a downfall, and that tends to lead to, in that particular coupling, um, higher levels of wear. But again, that, all these couplings have their place. And it's important to, to select it according to your application. There's often some transitions there where people might come to uh, trailer builders or the coupling people and ask, uh, I want to tow around my dog trailer, but then I need to be able to tow around a, a big air compressor or something like that as well. So they're often looking to see if there's a coupling that'll suit uh, both applications. And it's really where, uh, again, you need to talk to your coupling and, and trailer builder to see if you can get something in that instance that may suit both applications. Uh, th there's different methods in terms of um, attachment of the couplings. And in this side of things, I'm just looking at the drawbar eye aspect of it. I think the, um, the prime coupling um, side, that's typically their cross member into the back of the vehicle, whether it be welded or, or bolted and uh, manufacturers of the couplings or suppliers of the couplings would give you a bolt pattern and a technique to be able to do that. When it comes to the, the drawbar eyes, there's a few different products as well there and quite a few different techniques of, of attachment. So um, I've just got an image there down onto the uh, bottom left side there showing a welded drawbar eye onto the front of a dog trailer. Uh, it has some uh, fairly heavy plating to give it enough support uh, for the eye itself. And it's important with those that the welds are done to the manufacturer's specification and uh, periodically checked. In the, the middle image, just showing, my mouse will move around there, yep. Um, that's actually just like a close up of the drawbar eye. This one's painted yellow, so it helps to highlight uh, what we're looking at, I guess, here. And it's just showing when that uh, eye is connected into the, the coupling, it sits on a typically a wear plate 
um, in the mouth of the coupling, regardless of whose brand of, of coupling uh, it might be. And on the far right side, I've just shown an image there, which is an instance where the coupling has been left too long, uh, either not man maintained, or sometimes we see this when uh, manufacturers don't support the, the, the drawbar in terms of maybe putting the, the A-frame on some spring supports or so on to take uh, download off the, the eye. And you can see on the bottom of that particular uh, welding eye, how it's got quite a big concave shape, which would, would not be acceptable. And when you get to that point with this welding type means someone needs to go to the coupling, completely cut that coupling off. Someone needs to do re-weld prep, weld it back on again. So that's it's a coupling that's fairly inexpensive initially, but when it comes to doing some of that maintenance side of things, that can be um, more expensive in that sense and uh, something that certainly needs a lot more attention when you do come to um, do a repair or replacement. I'll just show on here, uh, this is now three different types of drawbar eyes, which now are all uh, demountable types. So I've put on the far left here, a single nut type where you have uh, typically a welded block into the front of your A-frame, which will have a through hole. And then the, the drawbar eye would be a shank type with a quite a large uh, thread and nut, castellated nut normally on the back of it to, to hold the, the whole thing secure. Then in the center of image, I've got uh, what would, it's, it's a brand of type 480, which is a cuff type. Um, bolt connection. So this coupling has a base which gets welded to the front of your A-frame. It's then designed that these cuffs have um, oh, sort of a, it's like a C, C section so that when you clamp the two parts together, that C section uh, holds the, the front part of the eye together. We'll see that perhaps in the next image a little bit clearer than I can explain it. Then I've got on the, the far right where other types of uh, drawbar eyes can be like a flange mount with axial bolts into the front um, flange of that coupling again. So it's a three di quite different types of mounting for bolting um, or replaceable type eyes. With all of these, um, the thing then is to replace them. It's relatively easy. Sometimes with this type coupling, it can be difficult to get into the nut just because of space. And you can see in this particular example, it's, it's fairly tight to get in there. So that's something that obviously needs attention. This one has four um, bolts, which are fairly easily uh, removed. You split the cuff and then you can put a new uh, eye in and then you put the two halves of the cuff back together. Then on the right side, fairly straightforward, you would have your axial bolts um, to be removed and replaced, replace the, uh, the eye itself. And then depending on the manufacturer, it might be this type with a, a threaded base, or it might be one that has nuts and bolts in behind as well. And it's retorqued, of course. Just following on from these, I've just put the same couplings um, here just taken a bit of an extract from some of the manufacturers or suppliers guides. So with this shank type, typically there'd be welds here to mount it into the uh, A-frame. And you can see how you've got the eye. It's got a shank goes through and a fairly big nut to the back. This cuff type where you can see there's these two split halves. As you undo the bolts, you can just split that off and then you can remove the the eye section off and then it will just sit in place and the cuff will hold it back together. Very straightforward with that one. With um, We can see here four M16 bolts holding it together. Uh, and this one on the far right is a base mount with depending on which particular one it is from different suppliers. They may have more or less different bolts, different bolt patterns that'll all be to do with 
what ratings that they have for that specific um, uh, drawbar eye itself. But again, fairly straightforward to do a replacement. And with all of these three, when you come to do replacement, there's no uh, hot work. So that's quite an advantage uh, generally. Uh, one other aspect I'll just talk about with um, with these sort of couplings in general is jackknifing and, and the couplings. So um, typically now we would see with PBS and the like, these vehicles are tending to get generally larger, I guess too with more um, uh, developments and so on around the, the cities, the infrastructure and so on that we're working in is um, in some cases getting smaller. So we're tending to see larger vehicles getting into perhaps smaller spaces and some of them can do that quite well. One of the downsides of that probably is with some of the turning that we see more instances for um, jackknifing of the vehicles, um, not necessarily going reversing, but even going in a forward direction. So it's important that uh, manufacturers and owners and uh, maintenance people are aware of that and to look at those things when uh, vehicles uh, come in. There are a few devices to help with, with uh, limiting jackknife damage that can be supplied by the coupling suppliers and some of the trailer builds are doing their own thing largely with what they've been called to do by their, their customers. And I've just got a, an example here of something that uh, can be fitted to a ring feeder type or an automatic tow eye type coupling. So what we offer there, you might be able to see just under here on the left, there's, this is the mouth of the, or the back of the coupling. That's the mouth where the, the eye would fit in. And then on the bottom side of this, we fit a, a bolted on piece with some um, teeth, not unlike an ABS pole wheel. And what we can do is we can break out these teeth. And when we turn to a certain position, this inductive sensor will pick up that the teeth are close together. And that can be then used to trigger a warning light or, or a um, buzzer back into the cabin. It's important when they do that, of course, that uh, the driver doesn't just hear the buzzer and keep going, that they do take some um, action um, and it can help prevent jackknife damage. And I've just got on the right side, uh, a typical jackknife, not, this is probably not too bad really in the scheme of things. Um, damage that's been done to the rear of that um, trailer and also on the side here, just on the plate where the, um, they've come into contact. I say that uh, different suppliers will have different methods to do this. So that's again, something just to be uh, talking to your suppliers about and your trailer builders. Uh, Quite a few people as well now we see you're putting um, reversing cameras and things like that in this this area to help with that side of things and again it's important that uh, again the drivers um, take the right action and um, make use of those those features when they are available okay i think that's that's all i've got for me so I'll... thanks ian <clears throat> all right well, thanks to Ian, the mania, and Sam for taking the time, not only out of your day to day to do this presentation, these presentations, but the time that you've taken out in preparing them, uh, and your participation in TMC 2021. Uh, I'd like to thank Emily for coordinating the recordings and uh, and also uh, keeping us a little bit organised and under control. To the delegates, please direct your comments and questions via the comment box. And uh, please enjoy the other TMC sessions live and on demand. Thank you and have a great day.